Welcome to another episode of Lawyers for Immigrants with your host, Ife He, president of the law office of Ife He, where they are dedicated to helping immigrants and new Americans. In every episode, Ife interviews attorneys across different practice areas and asks them how they are helping immigrants. You can find this show on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and at www.ifeheedlaw.com. Now here's the host of Lawyers for Immigrants, Ife He. Hello and welcome to my show, Lawyers for Immigrants. This is Ife He, your host, where we put the grant in immigrant. Every week I interview different attorneys from various practice areas and ask them how they're helping immigrants. And today, my guest is Neil Tyra of the law firm of Neil Tyra. He is an estate planning, wills, trust estates, and also part family lawyer. And I'm happy to have him on the show. Welcome, Neil. Oh, thank you, Ife. I'm uh, happy to be here. It's a real pleasure. Great. So can you tell us a little bit about your practice and what you do? Yeah, certainly. Uh, just to clarify the record, the law firm is called the Tyra Law Firm, LLC. Um, I've been in solo practice since uh, 2007. Um, I graduated from law school late in life. I uh, went to law school and graduated late in life, graduated in 2004. And initially, I was doing personal injury work. Uh, but then I left that firm and started my own practice. At that time, still doing personal injury, but I also added family law. Uh, Gradually, over the course of time, I started doing more family law than personal injury. I did that for many years until my kids got grown and moved away, and I wanted to um, uh, decouple myself from the courthouse and, and discontinue litigating. So that's when I transitioned into doing estate planning. So I've been doing estate planning and estate administration now for quite some time. Uh, and it's it's really kind of rewarding because it serves all the purposes that I needed to deal with as an attorney. I wanted to be able to help people directly. I didn't want to you know, work for companies or corporations or businesses. I wanted to work with people face-to-face uh, -face and, and directly. And it's something that I can do on kind of a transactional basis. I can do from anywhere that I'm located. I'm uh, completely virtual. So... Right now I'm in my home office, but sometimes I'll be at the office at the beach. And sometimes uh, starting next week, I'm gonna be in an office overseas for a little while. So it's, it's very rewarding to be able to help people that way. Great, so your guiding principle is helping people. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's uh, a fair uh, characterization. Um, you know, I think attorneys, I don't think, we all know, attorneys oftentimes get a bad rap, a bad reputation. In fact, I heard one survey that was ranking professions in terms of the amount of respect that people felt for those professions and attorneys ranked beneath prostitutes on that list. So I think it's an uphill battle for us as a profession. And uh, one of the ways that I'm able to address that and be comfortable is to work directly with people to try and help people. And so when I was doing family law, it was reward, even though family law can be difficult, it was rewarding when you knew you helped, you know, somebody move on and resolve an issue and make the, the, the decisions that were necessary for them to go on with their lives. And the same in estate planning, oftentimes people aren't real aware of why they need a will or why they need a trust or some of the other documents that we prepare as part of an estate plan. And so helping to educate them and helping them to realize that they're taking care of things and reducing that stress and that burden from their family is very rewarding. I see. So a big part of your practice involves educating people. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's if I can toot my own horn a little bit, I think that's one of the things that sets me apart from other attorneys and um, really resonates with my um, uh, my clients. Uh, I have always considered myself to some extent to, 
to be a teacher. In fact, my previous career, law, by the way, is my fourth career. Uh, my previous career, um, I was a martial arts instructor and I owned a martial arts studio and I taught hundreds and hundreds of children and adults um, in the practice of, of Goju Karate. And I would always, or I knew that I wasn't the best martial artist, but I was a really good teacher. And I tried to carry that um, that approach over to my law practice. I, I think the more you can educate your clients and the better you make them uh, able to understand what you're doing, the greater respect they'll have for what it is that you're asking them to do. Great, yeah, so that's one common commonality we'll share. We're both into karate because I myself is also a karate practitioner. Uh, I'm in Kyokushin, you're in Goju Ru, uh, mm -hmm. and we both, you know, advocate for our clients. But how does karate and being a teacher relate to estate planning? Because estate planning is sort of what happens towards the end of life. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things that we try and instill with our clients is attaining that peace of mind, that Zen-like approach, if you will, that comes from reducing stress and reducing anxiety. And frankly, people have a lot of anxiety uh, and a lot of stress about what's going to happen to their family um, should they meet, uh, you know, come to the end of their life or what's going to happen to their assets. Um, sadly, a lot of people don't stop to consider those questions until very late in their lives. They really should do so much earlier. But one of the things we try and do is help them understand that the use of a properly designed estate plan is going to not only make it easier for their family once they pass away, but it really takes the burden off of them right now. It really allows them to sit back and know that they've got all their affairs in order and they don't have to stress about it anymore. So the, 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 the motion that we hear from our clients most frequently is relief. They're relieved that they don't have to worry about it. They're relieved to know that their family is taken care of. They can take that, that worry off their plate and, you know, it, it allows them to be more uh, present in the moment. And that's, you know, really kind of what we try and do in the martial arts. You want to be present in the moment. And so I think there's a great deal of similarity. Right. No, definitely. What you just explained makes a lot of sense. Um, and that was a great metaphor of peace of mind and making a proper estate plan so that you won't have to worry even towards the end of your life when all things might be up in the air for the next generation. So... Uh, one thing that under, I understand about estate planning is that you should leave a will. So that's one of the critical pieces of an estate plan. So I was wondering if you can tell us more about the will. Yeah, I think when we, when we talk about estate planning, one of the fundamental questions is whether you want to do a will-based estate plan or a trust-based estate plan. Um, I may be honest with you, uh, I, I think uh, estate planning attorneys uh, too frequently push trust-based plans on potential clients, suggest that they need a trust, when in point of fact, I think a will is perfectly sufficient. One of, and, and they do that by, in my humble opinion, kind of preying on their fears that the probate process when you have a will is cumbersome and costly and takes a long time and um, is fraught with with challenges and problems and while that can be true um, i don't know that it's always the case and in fact i know that in the jurisdiction that i live in right now the pro the uh, the, the probate division of the court is really extraordinarily well run and the process is well defined and documented so i don't i don't know that you have to be all that worried about um going through the probate uh process so 
I, I generally advocate for my clients to do a will-based plan as opposed to a trust-based plan. Now, there are absolutely some good reasons for why you might, might want to use a trust. So I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, the trust has its, has its function and it has its place. <clears throat> but I think, as I said, more people can uh, take advantage of a will-based plan. So basically what a will does is, you know, I think people have kind of a general understanding of what it does, but ba basically it uh, provides for the ordered distribution of your assets after you pass away. And you do that by naming an executor, or sometimes it's referred to as a personal representative. That executor or personal representative is the person who um, kind of quarterbacks the process. So after you pass away, they are the ones that go to the court and initiate the probate process, gather up the assets, uh, and then propose to the court uh, how they are going to distribute them in accordance with the will. And once the court blesses that, then the uh, executor or personal representative can go about and distribute the assets. So the key point there is then you want a well-constructed will document. And a lot of people think they can go online and go to a do-it-yourself uh, platform and generate uh, a simple will. And while that may be true in the most simplest of estates, I, generally speaking, I don't think that's a really good idea. I really, because it is a complex document. And you're not here to explain what you meant after you, you, you die. So it's really important that you have a seasoned um, attorney assist you in the preparation of a will. And in doing so, you're going to identify who and what you want to uh, you know, to be uh, tra transferred upon uh, your passing, and so it's a it's a really important document to uh, to to work through. Great. So just to clarify on a few points, uh, probate is when you have to go through court, right? After you you finish the will, and the, someone the court usually a judge has to approve it. Is is that is that correct for probate purposes? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. And, and the reason for that is, is when you pass away and you own assets, say you own a house or a car or you have an investment account, okay, that's in your name. Even though you've written a will that says, I want my executor to give those assets to, let's say, my spouse or my children, um, it doesn't happen automatically. The court has to generate an order which gives you, the executor, the authority to do that. The will is the guidance that the court has and is, that is the expression of the intent of the decedent, what they want to have done, but legal authority to do that rests with the court. So you have to you know, make that presentation to the court and they have to uh, understand it and agree with it. And there's, you know, if, if the will is properly written and it's, it's clear, there's no reason for the court not to approve it. So the court's there just to provide an oversight and to make sure that everything goes where it's supposed to go pursuant to the will. I see, I see. And then... Uh, on the flip side, when you don't go through a probate is when you have to get a trust. So can you explain more about what a trust is versus a will? Yeah, so a, a, a trust is a little more complex document. And what the trust does, maybe it, it, it's, it, it's helpful to explain where trusts came from. They really come from uh, medieval times when when uh, the citizens of, of countries such as England uh, went to fight the Crusades and the landowners um, uh, had to do put somebody in charge of their estate while they were gone and tell them how to run it and where to, where to take the profits from that estate, what to do with them. 
And if they should die in battle, then who should get those assets um, uh, when that event occurs? That's what a trust was. That's how a trust came into being. And so that's what we do today. When a person generates a trust, usually we're talking about, there's different types of trust, but the, the most common type of trust is something called a revocable living trust. And a revocable trust simply means that you can, you can change it once you, once you generate the trust document and the trust comes into being. Um, it, it doesn't remain static. It, you can change it at any time. So there's three roles that people play in a trust. So the person who creates the trust is called the grantor. They create it. Initially, they're also the trustee. That means they control it. And initially, they're also the beneficiary. So the trust is set up for their benefit. So if I create a trust, I'm the grantor, I name myself as the trustee, I control all the assets in the trust, and any income that comes into the trust, uh, I can direct to be sent to the beneficiary, which in the initial situation is myself. Where this gets to be real advantageous is if I become incapacitated, um, I'm not yet, uh, I haven't passed, who's gonna take care of the, the, the trust? Who's gonna take care of the assets in the trust? So in the trust document, you name a successor trustee. So if I become incapacitated or I'm no longer able to care for myself, my successor trustee then takes over. They manage the trust, but they manage it on my behalf for my benefit. I'm still the beneficiary. Then when I pass, the trust document says what to do with the assets that are in the trust. And the trustee then follows those directions. So the trust is a private arrangement. It's a contractual arrangement. It exists uh, outside the scope of the probate process. So it does assets that are in the trust don't go through probate. And so it's private. It's sometimes quicker. Um, and it's uh, at times a little more flexible because for instance, um, if you want to extend the period of time over which a, an inheritance could be earned. So let's say you want to give um, your, your estate or, or portion of your estate to your children, but you don't want them to get it all at once. So you don't want your 18 year old son to get you know, a million dollars because doesn't know how to handle that. So you'd like to spread that out. You'd like to give them some money at, at the age of 18. You'd like to give them some money at the age of say 25 or when they graduate from college and some money at 30 or 35. You can spread that out however you want. The trustee is still managing the trust and will hold those funds and, and disperse them in accordance with your directions. You can't do that with a will. A will is all or nothing. If you say, I want it to go to my son, it will go to him, you know, a, a, as the state is processed and the probate uh, process is completed. So that's the difference. Okay? One goes through court, it's public, um, it's, everything is dispersed all at once. A trust is private, it doesn't go through the court. Um, and you can spread out the distribution of the assets. I see. So going to that metaphor of uh, the medieval times when someone's about to go into battle and they leave a trustee to take care of their trust so that they can handle their assets in the event that they don't come back. That's that's a great metaphor. So yeah. um, from that, you know, I just want to know if, if you're an immigrant if you, or if you're not a citizen of the U.S. or even if you're undocumented, can you still do a trust? Can you still do a will? Sure, you can do all of that. And, and I will say that um, it, it's, um, it, it's equally as important for uh, those who come to this country from, from another country. And, and, and I'm going to just, just anecdotally, uh, I will tell you that um, it, it's sometimes a little difficult for people who, who have you know, backgrounds from other countries to kind of understand all of this because you know, 
the process is different in other places in other countries and what i have found uh mostly with my clients who are uh, immigrants or second gen second or third generation like for instance um a lot of them have been told by their parents who came over you know after the war or whenever um to invest in real estate so i find that more and more uh, people of, of foreign background have larger real estate assets or more real estate assets than say the average American who owns one home. Uh, I find that people of different, you know, uh, immigrant uh, backgrounds uh, frequently own multiple homes and, and, and or multiple real estate holdings. Um, it's very common. And so in that scenario, uh, I said before, there are some good reasons to use a trust. That's one of the good reasons to use a trust. If you have multiple properties, and particularly if you have properties in multiple jurisdictions, multiple states, um, it makes much more sense to have a trust-based estate plan than it does to have a will-based estate plan because you can consolidate everything within one trust. So I've, I'll bet if you looked at the statistics for my uh, practice, I bet I've written more trusts for um, people from other countries than I have for people who have been you know, in this country for generations or whose family has been here. Wow, okay. That makes a lot of sense because say you had a lot of real estate holdings across different states. Uh, you don't want to go through the will and the probate process for each state. You rather just That's have exactly one trustee right. uh, distribute all the assets according to your wishes. So yeah. that does make a lot of sense yeah. for one, one of the other differences between a will and a trust space plan too is, you know, for a will, you write the will and then you for, you know essentially you forget about it. You don't have to do anything until. Um, until you pass, and then your your executor, or your your personal representative, probates the 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 estate in accordance with that will. So in that scenario, all the work is done after you die. In a trust, after you create the trust document, the trust becomes a legal entity, and um, but it's kind of like a treasure chest or a safe unless you put something in it that's empty unless you put something into it it's really useless it's, you know you might have the most glorious safe or the you know the prettiest treasure chest but unless you put some assets into it um it, it it's useless so in a trust what you do is after you create the trust, then you have to move the assets into the trust. You have to retitle property in the name of the trust, which is okay because you're the grantor, you are the trustee, you are the beneficiary. So it's really just kind of a paper shovel um, with important legal ramifications. So you retitle the, the uh, properties in the name of the trust, or you redirect assets that that have a beneficiary statement, you pay that, have them paid into the trust as opposed to somebody directly. So that's what's called funding the trust. And in that case, all the work really takes place before you pass. So that when you pass, it's already there. It's already in the trust. You don't, your trustee, your successor trustee doesn't have to do anything because all the assets are already owned by the, by the trust. So that's a, another big difference. A will, all the work's done after you die. A trust, all the work is done before you die. I see. So are there any restrictions on either a will or a trust? Um, for example, can you give property to someone who's overseas um, in a will or trust? You can. It gets a little, it gets a little more complicated. Um, so let's say I have a home here and I have a family member who lives in, um, um, just say England, for an example, I want to give them uh, the home as part of my estate. I could do that, I can name them. Uh, and then what would happen is the trustee, I'm sorry, the, the 
executor or the personal rep would uh, then allow for the retitling of the home in the name of the person who lives overseas. Now, the, the challenge is somebody overseas now owns a piece of property here. So that gets a little more, that, that gets, the logistics of that gets difficult. But let's say I just wanted to give them $100,000. So my will says, give them $100,000. Well, the estate, when it gets probated, the personal rep, if it's, if it's approved, will then write a check out of the estate account and send it to the individual who lives in England or whatever foreign country they live in. So yes, you can, you can bequest, bequeath rather, you can bequeath assets to an individual who lives overseas outside of the U.S. Okay. Well, what about in terms of, uh, you know, expenses and getting a trust? We've heard the expression trust fund babies, and it's usually something considered out of someone's budget. So is it very expensive to do a trust or a will? No, not, not really. Um, it's a little more expensive to do a, um, a trust because there's a little more work involved. There's more documents involved uh, for a trust-based plan versus a, um, a a will-based plan. So, I mean, I, I think for the most part, there it's reasonable um, reasonable costs. I think where people get a little hung up is they say, "Well, look, I can go online and I can generate this for a couple of hundred dollars." Well, that's true, and I I will tell you that I have spent a, a lot of time working with clients who um, have brought me the products of those efforts, uh, only to find out that they're not effective. They were, you know, done incorrectly, or they don't say what the person thought they said. But because they didn't have an attorney, there's nobody there to say, "Hey, you did this wrong." So when they say, well, what does is, what is your will-based plan cost? Um, and you tell them, well, a couple of thousand dollars, it, their first reaction is, I'd rather go with a couple of hundred. Well, yeah, I can understand that, but a, a, a $200, $250 will that doesn't work, that doesn't say what you want it to do, is worthless. Wouldn't you rather pay a little more money and get something that's going to do exactly what you want. So it doesn't have to be expensive to, to generate a, a will or a trust. Right. No, definitely. I think anybody who's listening to the show should seriously consider hiring Neil or a trusted trust and estates attorney to do your will or trust because the mistakes you'll avoid will far outweigh the cost you would spend on that professional, uh, such as Neil, it's sort of like a metaphor of doing martial arts to try to get a black belt on your own versus having an instructor like Neil guide you through the, yeah. throughout the whole process, get, guide you through years of training. I wouldn't recommend it because you'll actually break your hand on a on a wooden board if you tried it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or, so, or or when you when when it comes time for you to have to use your martial arts, God forbid, you want to make sure that you're uh, you've been trained properly. Exactly, exactly. So that comes to the conclusion of our show. Uh, so the last question for Neil, is there any other resources that he would like to share for, for immigrants or the listeners of this show? Um, well, I, I think you're, you're pretty safe in um, you know, using the internet to educate yourself. So there's a lot of resources. The NOLO uh, Law Library, N-O, LO Law Library, you can um, access that via the internet uh, to, to understand what is a will, what is an executor, what is a personal representative, um, what is a power of attorney, those kinds of things. I think those are, the internet is really fine for educating yourself there. You can also visit our website. We have a number of videos on the website that, that we've posted short videos that express um, or edu help educate our, our viewers. And so you just go to tyralawfirm.com, T-Y-R-A lawfirm, all one word, dot com. You look at the videos or our blog posts there and you can learn more 
um, uh, if, if that's what you're interested in. Right, definitely. Check out Neil's uh, website, Tire Law Firm, and also check out his podcast, too. He hosts a podcast, he interviews all sorts of different professionals about entrepreneurship. And, of course, check out his videos. He does video socials with me on a weekly basis. He educates his listeners and his viewers. So, again, thank you very much for watching our show. We appreciate your support. You've been listening to Lawyers for Immigrants with your host, Yves He. You can find prior episodes on YouTube, LinkedIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and at www.ifeheelaw.com. Thank you for your positive reviews, comments, and sharing this show with others.